Hello and welcome to the HistoryNetwork.org podcast. If you would like to become a patron of the podcast, just pop along to patreon.com forward slash the History Network. Thank you to all our patrons who make this podcast possible. The History Network.org podcast, season 34, episode 3, The Treason of Benedict Arnold, part 3. This episode was written by Michael Gaby Gross. Michael received his master's degree in history from the California State University, Sacramento. His thesis project analysed the Phoenix Program, a CIA counterinsurgency operation during the Vietnam War. Benedict Arnold had chosen treason in a shocking turn of events. One of the most talented American generals had turned traitor. The news sent shockwaves throughout the rebellious states. Arnold became the most wanted man in America as George Washington made it clear he wanted Arnold captured and put on trial. Arnold, however, was safely behind British lines. Left behind had been the British officer sent to recruit him, John Andre, another victim of Arnold's greed. But that was of little concern to Arnold now that his treason was complete and he a brigadier general in the British army, his focus was on winning the war and ensuring his place in history. Arnold chose to justify his actions in an open letter titled To the Inhabitants of America. He maintained he joined the war to fight the injustice levelled against the colonies by Parliament, but once Great Britain granted redress for these grievances, the necessity of war ended. He claimed dismay at the alliance with the colony's old enemy France and assured readers his actions were not for personal glory. I was only solicitous to accomplish an event of decisive importance and prevent as much as possible in the execution of it, the effusion of blood. These pleas fell on deaf ears. Arnold betrayed the cause he had sworn an oath to defend. A week later, he followed this with an appeal to soldiers of the Continental Army for them to follow in his footsteps in joining the British. This, too, met with minimal success. After Peggy and the children joined him in New York in November, Arnold set about recruiting for his new Loyalist regiment, the American Legion, made up of previous deserters of the Continental Army. Arnold spent his time meeting with British generals, submitting proposals for attacks on American positions, and pressing Clinton to pay him what Andre had promised if the plot failed, £10,000. His brash behaviour won him few friends. He expected a hero's welcome in New York, the redeemed former rebel who now sought to put down this bloody rebellion and his personal knowledge of the American generals used Clinton's advantage. Loyalist civilians flocked to the Arnolds, but British officers distrusted him. They would not forget that Arnold's actions directly led to the death of Andre, and so far Arnold's treachery had brought the British no benefit. Washington's officers wanted vengeance. His cavalry officer, Henry Lee, wanted Arnold dead, Lee proposed a member, John Chomp, of his cavalry would desert to Arnold's American Legion. Washington made it clear that Chomp was to apprehend Arnold and bring him back alive to face charges. No circumstances whatever, Washington told Chomp, shall attain my consent to the, his being put to death. My aim is to make a public example of him. Chomp succeeded in joining the Legion and gaining Arnold's confidence, but the plot failed when Arnold ordered his men aboard ships as he finally received new orders. The American Legion would be unleashed on Washington's home state of Virginia. Arnold's troops landed on January the 4th, 1781, and marched on the capital, Richmond. There they surprised Governor Thomas Jefferson fled just ahead of Arnold's cavalry. Richmond burned, as did houses, tobacco fields, foundries and warehouses in the surrounding area. British reinforcements soon arrived, along with Major General William Phillips, who took command. Washington responded by ordering a force under the command of the Marquis de Lafayette to march south to confront the new threat and capture Arnold if possible. 
In discussion with an American, Arnold inquired what would happen to him if he was captured. The American said they would first cut off the leg wounded at Saratoga and bury it with honour, then hang the rest. The British retreated to the coast to await the arrival of Cornwallis's army marching from North Carolina. When Cornwallis arrived, Arnold, already suffering from an attack of gout, received permission to return to New York. His first British command ended in disappointment. While waiting for Cornwallis's arrival and continuing upon his return to New York, Arnold criticised Clinton's management of the war. Arnold still sought the fame and fortune that drove him to switch sides, and Clinton had refused to unleash him. Arnold audaciously wrote to Lord George Germain, the Secretary of State for the Colonies, to complain about Clinton, of which Clinton soon learned and reassigned Arnold to menial tasks. Horrified with how low he had fallen, Arnold wrote to both Germain and Clinton to express his sincere apologies and remind them of his eagerness to serve. Clinton refused to forgive him and allowed Arnold to languish in New York. In September, Clinton finally found a purpose for Arnold. He was to lead a raid against American shipping and supplies in the harbour of New London, Connecticut, mere miles from his boyhood hometown of Norwich. Arnold would not let personal history distract from opportunity. He gathered his force of loyalists, British redcoats, and Hessian Jaegers, and set sail for home. Arnold's new London raid ended far more successfully than his Virginia raid, but it served to blacken his name even further. His loyalist troops burnt the port and warehouses, while the redcoats stormed the nearby Fort Griswold. The outnumbered American garrison inflicted heavy casualties on the British before the surviving garrison surrendered, but after an exchange of words between a British officer and the American commander, the British officer ran the American through with his own surrendered sword. The British officer was shot, and the British unleashed their fury on the prisoners, slaughtering the surviving garrison to nearly the last man. Arnold, though nowhere near the fort, received the blame for the massacre. In his report of the raid, Arnold downplayed the massacre and his own casualties, but no one believed Arnold any longer. He returned to New York, not as the conquering hero, but rather as a butcher. By the time news of Cornwallis's surrender at Yorktown reached New York, Arnold and Clinton sought to go their separate ways. Arnold received permission to travel to London to present his views on the war to Germain, Parliament, and even the King, a far more aggressive general, Arnold believed, would win the war in 1782. Arnold, Peggy, and the children boarded ships for the journey to England. Arnold could not suspect it at the time, but he would never again set foot in America. By the time he arrived in London, there was little remaining support for the war. Parliament sought to end the war against the King's preference, and the government collapsed, replacing the pro-war ministry with a new Whig ministry seeking peace terms, Refusing to accept this turn of events, Arnold sought to return to America with Clinton's replacement. Carlton, who opposed Arnold in Quebec and on Lake Champlain, Carlton wanted nothing to do with Arnold and left him behind when he sailed for New York, while other British officials turned their backs on him. Meanwhile, Andre became a poetic, tragic hero of the war and sacrifice of Arnold's insatiable demand for wealth and renown. The king commissioned a marble monument to Andre in Westminster Abbey, while Arnold inspired the verse, Our troops by Arnold thoroughly were banged, and poor St. Andre was by Arnold hanged. To George a rebel, to the Congress traitor, pray what can make the name of Arnold greater. By one bold treason, to gain his ends, let him betray his new adopted friends. Arnold gambled everything on his betrayal because he expected, as many did, the power and wealth of the British Empire would win out over the fledgling former colonies. He saw himself being hailed a hero and granted the prosperity and fame he spent his life chasing. Instead, his grievous 
miscalculation doomed him for all eternity. His post-war years saw one failure after another. Arnold sought appointments in the Army, Navy, and even in the British East India Company, which were all rejected. He appealed for the money promised to him despite his plot failing. He filed for compensation as a loyalist refugee. He made bold claims of extravagant figures owed to him for turning down appointments in the Continental Army out of loyalty to the King. Arnold then tried his hand at trade as he attempted to restart his former mercantile business in New Brunswick, Canada. He returned to London in 1791, following a string of bad business deals, angry former partners and a pariah. His health deteriorated over the years and gout kept him in constant pain. He could no longer go to sea and could only walk with a cane. He would die a broken man ten years later on June 14th, 1801, at the age of 60. Legend has it that on his deathbed, Arnold said to Peggy, Bring me, I beg of you, the epaulets and sword knots which Washington gave me. Let me die in my old American uniform, the uniform in which I fought my battles. God forgive me for ever putting on any other. Had he died at Saratoga soon after the dramatic triumph over the British and capture of their army, Arnold would have consecrated his name as a preeminent hero of one of the fathers of his country. But Arnold lived. He grew bitter at Congress for years of perceived mistreatment. His desire for fame and fortune came from, as a young man, watching his father's business collapse and his father sinking into alcoholism, pushing him to selfish actions and a short temper. One British critic identified his actions correctly when describing Arnold as a mean mercenary who, having adopted a cause for the sake of plunder, quits it when he is convicted of that charge. Back in May 1777, upon his resignation from the army, one old enemy wrote in a pamphlet about Arnold, Money is this man's god, and to get enough of it he would sacrifice his country. Money was not his only motivation. While military governor of Philadelphia, Arnold fell in love with the daughter of a loyalist and found himself embraced by other loyalist citizens of the city. He protected them against the intrigues of Joseph Reed, and they in turn encouraged Arnold to seek redemption in a British uniform. Following Washington's reprimand for his schemes while serving as a military governor, Arnold severed all connection to the American cause and sought to make his enemies pay. His plot to surrender West Point failed and exposed him as a traitor. Arnold fled to the British to become a minor figure in the final stages of the war. Had he died at Saratoga, Arnold would be an American hero. Instead, he is America's greatest villain. Well, Michael, thank you so much for writing that incredible episode. If you would like to write an episode for us, then just drop us a line with your idea, info at thehistorynetwork.org. Join us in a couple of weeks for the next episode. Do go along to patreon.com forward slash the history network and become a patron. And thanks to all our patrons who make this podcast possible. Thanks again for listening. You've been listening to the historynetwork.org podcast, written by Michael Gravy Gross read by Nick Barker.